LD Comics is a women-led, welcoming-to-all forum run by creators. We champion the graphic novel form, particularly works with an autobiographical voice. Our activity is towards supporting and equipping graphic novelists, especially, but not exclusively, people identifying as women. Established in 2009 by Sarah Lightman and Nicola Streeton as Ladies Do Comics, today LD Comics is run by a committee of six published graphic novelists. Charlotte Bailey, Rachel Ball, Emma Burley, Lou Crosby, Wallace Eats and Nicola Streeton. From the start, the core of LDC's activity has been the monthly meetings, hosting presentations from invited guests to a public audience in a welcoming atmosphere for networking and making friends. The introduction of LDC online monthlies aims to replicate the joy and stimulation of our physical meetups. Everyone is welcome. Um, I just want to say, uh, start by saying that uh, there could be some images which are disturbing uh, in this talk. I hope it's okay. It's just that uh, all my work seems to revolve around disturbing topics. So I hope um, uh, no one is too upset. Um, it's very nice to be here. I'm a big fan of both uh, Hannah and um, uh, Zara. And I'm also really happy when I saw everyone coming in. There's a lot of people, uh, Instagram friends that I don't know in real life, but uh, now I see they're here. So it was very nice to see your faces. Um, so, um, I'll go quickly. Um, I'll just give my comics credentials first. So, uh, I have done uh, one book with Self Made Hero, which was an adaptation of um, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, um, which, has, which I did in 2010, and it's since been translated into many languages. Um, it's a book about the occupation of the Congo and uh, my main entry point to that was that the people who are represented in that uh, story have been represented in a way that they haven't chosen. So it was important to me to use visual language in this book to, as a critical method, as a way to try to disrupt the, 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 the memory of, of um, these people and change the narrative a little bit in the way it was remembered. Uh, I just show a few images from that book. This is um, the Congo River. Uh, this is uh, the Congo. Um, I was also trying to make the landscape a protagonist in this story because uh, Conrad's text, he talks about it in such detail, like these trees, these looming trees, these tangled roots, the river, they're all sort of um, characters that oppress the main character. So that was very important to me as well. Uh, and the, the book is also a lot about the unwinding of the main character's uh, mental health as he goes down the river to in the Congo to fetch this uh, sort of criminal warlord uh, who also uh, uh, suffers a mental breakdown at the end. Um, another book I've done is called Skandorama. <clears throat> it's a Swedish and Finnish book. Uh, that I did in 2018. And uh, this novel is about uh, contrast between two cities. It's about the future. The Heart of Darkness is about the past. Um, it's about uh, immigration and eugenics and uh, one city, Stockholm, being very um, um, sort of glittering and amazing and one and Helsinki being uh, very gritty and where all the people with the less than perfect genes end up. So these are some pages from that. And this is also a page from that showing the contrast between the two. Um, another comic I've just done right now is a um, uh, self-made hero who published Heart of Darkness have just done this graphic anthology program where um, six or six or seven um, uh, established comics, comics artists mentored um, uh, we mentored two each uh, up and coming comics artists uh, to produce an eight page comic. And um, so we, we also, the mentors also produced an eight page comic. And this was mine, it was called The Host. And it was about Zoom, <laughs> but it was a kind of horror story about Zoom um, where the host, um, uh, his mother is frozen and she's actually frozen and she breaks. And it was a kind of actually comment on um, power and the idea of um, uh, 
people who play God and the idea of the host being someone who plays God. Uh, and the characters uh, in this were all um, gynecologists and doctors who had uh, abused women in their care by either artificially inseminating them or like uh, mutilating them uh, under their care. So that was, I'm not gonna talk about that one because it's still up and coming. <laughs> but this is just an example. And I'm just in the middle of uh, working on an adaptation of uh, Dead Man Walking by Sister Helen Prejean. Um, I don't know if anyone is like me old enough to remember when the film came out, but it's an account of the death penalty in the US. It was written in um, 1993, published in 1993, but it's about the 70s and 80s, um, the death penalty in the US uh, and two characters who go through this. Um, and with this book, um, a little bit like Heart of Darkness, what I've been trying to do is to cast a critical eye on the subject matter. And uh, in both of those, I'm trying to sort of expand the black experience um, in the book because both in Heart of Darkness and in Dead Man Walking, the focus is on the white protagonist, but the people who experience most of the oppression in the death penalty and in uh, colonialism for the black subjects. So those are the books I have been working on. Oh, sorry, here are some pages in progress uh, <laughs> from Dead Walking. And please uh, uh, forgive me because uh, the book is such a, so much in progress. So all the pages I'll show you from this book are not finished. But uh, this is what it looks like at the moment. It's set in Louisiana. Um, in the US, and it's been quite fun to sort of draw that environment. It's very hot and also very cold. But um, because this uh, talk is so short, I was trying to think of, I um, can't show you everything I've done. Um, so trying to think of how I can talk about my work in an interesting way. And I thought I'd just touch on one theme, which is quite important to me, which is the idea of, um, disruption of the the uh, graphic novel surface and also disruption or, or the book the disruption of the book surface and the disruption of an, an image so the fragmentation of an image and i think this is something that i keep kind of intuitively turning back to all the time so the way that you draw something and how that com can communicate meaning and also the way that you structure the book and how that can communicate meaning so uh, one of the most useful things you have in a graphic novel is the panel um, and what that means to us emotionally as a reader. Uh, and so when I did Heart of Darkness so far so long ago, I was experimenting with how to disrupt the expectations of the reader and the expectations of how they saw the panels um, and how that could move the story along subliminally. So here you can see that, uh, oh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, no. But on the left, you have like um, the main character Marlo, I'm pointing to my screen, <laughs> being um, cut in half by the panels. Um, and on, on his right, you have the other main character who is even more disturbed, being cut in half even more grotesquely. And then on the right here, you have um, the main character in three panels and Kurt's the one who has, uh, completely let go of the world. He's outside the panels. And this has been a big thing for me, trying to take people outside of the panels because uh, the panel is such an important thing in the graphic novel. And if you put a character outside them, it, it suddenly means something. I think I did this also in the, here with the woman falling out of the panel in the host. Again, here with the panels, um, the, there's such an immense claustrophobia in the in the in the writing. Um, I was trying to sort of think about the passage of time through these panels, but also how he was so oppressed by this landscape and sort of emotionally uh, hemmed in. So I tried to draw an um, overhead view of the uh, forest uh, in the Congo and just have a little gap in the trees as the panels to try to. Um, uh, again disrupt that rectangle and make it into something new and here we have um, the main character in a panel on the left side but 
he's described the, the description of um, the characters in in the book is that they're sort of merging with the landscape their their psyche is merging with the landscape so you have the panel borders sort of disappearing um into the background to try and show this sort of uh what's it called gap between mental reality and physical reality and again with the idea of fragmentation i drew the whole book um i drew the book sort of as we went along, as he went down the river, uh, I drew it smaller and smaller um, and then blew the pages up to the right size so that um, they would get very, very fragmented. So you could kind of see the gaps between the pencil um, marks um, to try and kind of grasp that, uh, I don't know, that uh, breaking down of reality in a physical way. And so this is from Skandarama, and they also go down, <laughs> they go on a long train ride where someone's mental health breaks down. Uh, and so here I was trying to um, show these hallucinations he was having by tilting the panels. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but um, they kind of um, merge with the panels and the panel, they, they, they sit on the wrong parts of the, of the, um, what's it called, truck. Um, depending on, on how ill the person feels. And I mean, these things are kind of, they're fun for the read. And I think it's also mostly fun for the comics artists because sometimes it can get uh, a little bit monotonous to draw a comic. And the more you can do to make it interesting for yourself, I think the, the and for the reader, the, the easier it is to carry on. <laughs> um, here's also from Sandorama um, where, Again, the character is um, hallucinating and uh, feeling ill. And I broke him up on the right-hand side. I broke him up into a series of different panels to try and emphasize the sort of disintegration of his mental reality um, as opposed to the physical reality of everyone else. So uh, this is from Dead Man Walking. Um, this is super rough. This is one of the roughs, so don't judge. Uh, but here, again, it's the same thing. Um, we have this... Um, portrait of the, it's, this is the Jim Crow era, segregated era in uh, the United States, uh, portrait of the family um, in the panel, but then outside the panel is the, the maid and the gardener who maintain this sort of perfect picture, but they're outside, they're outside the sort of structure of the graphic novel. And again, down here on the bottom uh, in the bus where people had to sit segregated. So they're outside the main uh, drawing of the train and in church again, uh, had to see the back of church, so they're outside the panel. And here we have the same idea again. Sorry. <coughs> um, it's a black woman being kicked off the bus uh, at that time, uh, and she goes outside the panel. This is also rough, bear with me. Um, she goes outside the panel because Again, once you break that panel border in a graphic novel, you have a distinct sense that something is wrong. Also on this page, I tried to use a double page spread to um, emphasize the idea of, here we have this tree, uh, and this, this, this image on the left is based on a famous lynching photo. Um, and uh, lynchings were often photographed and those photographs were sold as um, keepsakes or mem mementos of the event. Um, and what I have is extended it into the right hand side. And we have the um, protagonist, Helen, as a child swinging from the same tree uh, that a man is hanging from on the left hand side to show that uh, people who were kind of ignorant or willfully ignorant of what was happening back then are also complicit in the same, in the violence that happened. So it's, it, these things are happening in the same landscape. It wasn't two different times, it was, two different events at the same time. So um, this book, it's, um, it's, it's, it's been hard to draw because it's, um, what happens in the book is that uh, the nun, Sister Helen, uh, she is um, going to death row to speak to a prisoner who is going to uh, be executed. And she goes home, she drives to prison, she talks to him in his cell and then she drives back home. So it was a little bit difficult to, to uh, make it interesting visually because the same thing happens over and over again. 
So I had to sort of try to think of ways to move the story on while keeping drawing the same um, thing. Uh, so I decided to go back to this idea of um, fragmentation or disruption. And um, I decided to um, really focus on the, sorry, I've got a little cough. It's not COVID. <laughs> I have COVID already. <coughs> um, these bars in the prison, these um, meshes and these uh, prison bars and also the tiles that uh, the whole prison is tiled for some reason. And it's described in the book as with these uh, grids of shiny tiles and they're always highly polished and there's these bars everywhere. So um, I always have Helen, uh, if you can see on the left hand side, out, without any panel boundaries and the prisoner very bounded. But what I decided to do as well was to, as the book moved along, um, to play with that rigid structure of the tiles and the lines um, to emphasize this feeling of claustrophobia and um, imprisonment, like how it feels to be within a structure. Um, so I drew it kind of normally at first um, with the perspective and the everything right, but you know, having a lot of lines everywhere. Uh, then I started to um, change the angles a bit and emphasize the tiles and make them a little bit more, I don't know, angly <laughs> and uh, claustrophobic um, and make the characters feel a little bit more uncomfortable in this sort of systematic grid. Um, then... Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, okay. I was trying oh, to put it subtly, just like just so you know you've got five. No minutes. worries, I have a lot left, but uh, it's totally fine. Um, so here, um, uh, here she has an emotional scene in the background, and the tiles go crazy because uh, she's um, also in her mental state, going a little bit crazy. Then I started using isometric grid on the on the tiles because um, that's a very um, uh, strict structure, so it, it sort of becomes stricter as a time moves on. And here we have the sort of panels pushing as his time runs out, pushing into his personal space. And finally, when he walks to the um, electric chair, then the, the, the lines just go crazy and sort of overwhelm the subjects. Um, so we have five minutes left. I was going to talk a bit about my other practice, which is just drawing in the same in the same vein. But I can just show one, maybe. Uh, so I've been working a lot with like erasure and the idea of like fragmenting an image by uh, erasing it, because I think we all know like the act of drawing, we try to do, make something permanent and perfect. And the act of erasing means something's gone wrong. Uh, so I've been trying to, is it play? work with the idea of un undrawing an image or unweaving an image to talk about something that has gone wrong. So I've done this in a few different projects. And this is a film I made called It Happened in Ingemanland, which is about um, Stalin's uh, reign of terror and uh, the disappearance of about 500,000 people. Um, and uh, I show this one quickly. This is a, a film about Michael Brown in the USA, who um, is part of a big series I've done uh, about people's last images uh, in the world. And here I'm just, instead of erasing, I'm just drawing so much that the paper disintegrates. Um, and this is again, to highlight the fact that when we do a drawing, we, we try to make it something permanent. But what happens if you do it so much that everything uh, disintegrates and goes wrong and fragments? I'm starting here. A little bit of the. Oh, oh it doesn't want to play. Oh. No. <laughs> well, it was it was going to play, but you can see what happens. It just sort of disintegrates over time, and um, uh, I think that it's also kind of metaf uh, not metaphorically, but. Um, so conceptually, it, uh, it shows us that the things that we think are permanent or solid, like the law, um, um, like people that, like, for example, police who are supposed to protect us, those things are also um, fallible and uh, uh, 
can be um, dissolved, they, th those concepts can dissolve. And so I think that's something that feeds very much into my graphic novels, this idea that um, the, the, the idea of justice and morality uh, is something that can be subverted um, and often is. And how do you show that visually? How do you uh, reach out to an audience with a graphic novel and try to tell a story of something that has gone so wrong um, that we can't quite put it right? Not in words, but visually. I think that's what a graphic novel is really um, interesting for because uh, it's a way for us to communicate, not just with text, but uh, to two different parts of a person's mind, to the empathetic center and to the sort of intellectual center. So it's very important to me to use graphic novels to try and talk about justice and morality. Yeah, so that's the, the image is erasing over time. It's like when I watch YouTube, I can't. Uh... I'm Hannah Lee Miller, and uh, what I wanted, uh, and, and by day I'm an animation producer, and then the rest of the time I try and squeeze in being creative. Uh, I decided to talk about why do I keep making artwork about my dad? Because I'm kind of embarrassed about it because it's like, come up with something original, Hannah, but um, it's an important topic to me. So to take you back in time, in 2005, my dad had a stroke. Um, and I was, at the time I was in the middle of, um, I was in the middle of doing my animation degree, second year, and I was supposed to come up with, um, a, what do they call it? They used to call it minor and major. And I had to come up with a major animation um, story. And all I could think about was my dad being sick in hospital and having a stroke. So that's when I sort of stumbled upon documentary animation and decided to make my story about what I thought was going on through my dad's head. Um, finally, when he, when he woke up in hospital um, or when he came to and started to be able to communicate, one of the first things he did, these, these are stills from my film, my animation graduation film, but one of the first things he did was put a, I put a sketch pad, a pencil in his hand, and he started drawing these faces. And they were so, he couldn't speak, he couldn't stand, he couldn't do anything, but he, all he was doing was drawing these faces. And it was like, he was trying to communicate. Um, my dad, all my life has been an artist, but like me, that wasn't his day job. Um, he just tried to squeeze it in everywhere. But um, so to get him doing art again, it was like he was trying to speak and communicate and to say what was going on. And I tried to incorporate, incorporate that into my film, which was on Vimeo, but I'll have to put it somewhere if anybody wants to check it out. It's called Lost and Found. Um, so my dad recovered and he went home and um, I thought a stroke's a stroke and you get better, but I didn't know about vascular dementia. Um, when someone has a stroke, their brain is damaged and uh, there's a sort of deterioration that can slip in, not, probably not for every stroke, but for my dad, it became vascular dementia. He used to go to ceramics classes quite a lot um, before his stroke and then he carried on going after his stroke and you can see the deterioration in his work. So you have his, he was quite a fine sculptor with wood and he had quite fine motor skills and you could see the gradual deterioration till it got to the point that he would just go to ceramics and just sit there. And they were very nice. He's very, he was a very cheery chap and he'd just sit there and um, chat with people as they sculpted. But um, this is my, this is a clip from my comic Dementia Dad, because what happened at that period is as he deteriorated, as we learned about vascular dementia, as we learned about what was happening, um, he, he became more and more unreliable. So he couldn't go to, he, he would go missing basically. So he'd go to ceramics and then we wouldn't know where he'd got to. I used my art to 
explore what again what was going on and I made a small comic about the relationship between my mum and dad and how anxious it would make her to have to care for him and again it's that shock and surprise of the deterioration and adapting so this was about their relationship and about the intimacy and the care between them and um, that despite anything that they were still you know good friends after check my list um hopefully i'm not waffling too much um and dad plateaued that's the thing with vascular dementia you get plateaus and then something will happen and then in 2013 i think my dad got um, pneumonia and his ability to cope dropped so he went when he got pneumonia he went to hospital um next slide and my way of coping was I had to go and sit with someone who wasn't very responsive and wasn't well. So I would take my sketchbook and um, I would I would draw him sitting there. Um, it was pretty hard, but I started making cartoons to try and talk about to myself, to to no specific audience what I was going through. So first visit when he had the stroke before dad could speak, he drew faces. Each hospital visit, he fades a little bit more waiting to see him dad at hospital he always drew he loved stationery and pens which often leaked and then his dad are you in there dad so it's sort of using my art just like he the, does did to um explore what I was going through why do I keep making art about my dad this is why um then in that time when he was in hospital he was away for about 10 weeks and it was that learning curve of what was going on and I did make a comic called 10 weeks away which um sort of uh, mapped everything that happened I, I hadn't actually ever printed it because it it touched too much on some family stuff so I've never found I've not really got to the point of being able to uh, neutralize it enough to put it out there without upsetting anyone but that was again exploring what my dad was going through. So sometimes he would sing when he didn't know what to say. Um, what's next? Ah, uh, yeah. So dad came home eventually, uh, 2013 is a while ago now. Um, and uh, I often dad sit. So dad's deteriorated to a point where he can't really walk. He can't stand. He, um, He's actually now he's quite bed bound, but I, I have to dad sit so mum can go and do stuff. So I'll sit with dad and I'll get a sketchbook out and I start sketching him. Um, and I've asked him, does he mind? And he's like, no, I used to draw you. And I try and capture some of the weird stuff he says. So he once asked me if there was fish under the chair or he started explaining how his pillow was some antique. <laughs> Or he starts chatting to people on TV, or he once said, um, "There's a there's a mountain at the end of the road." Um, it's just sort of like like he's in another another world. Uh, other ways he'd sneak into my artwork is um, ceramics. This was this is a him. I don't know if you can see me in the little picture, but it was actually originally without a hat. But I felt bad, and I thought his head would get cold, so I made him a flat cap. Um, but well, that was an intentional, but sometimes, let's see, click. Sometimes he sneaks in when I didn't expect. I decided I wanted to make a giant hand in ceramics. And then when I finished it, I suddenly realized it's my dad's hand. And it was kind of like, oh, okay. It's, it's, it's just that thing that's, it's like a stream running underneath the back of your brain. So the latest comic I've made is it's about that it's called ambiguous loss and it's about the fact that when someone hasn't died you you still have to grieve the person that you've lost so the person they are now um is almost like a different person to the person they were um so i've done a sort of comic where i talk about what he did and what he what i do for him now so he used to hold my hand i used to hold his hand um, now I hold his hand. He used to sketch me, now I sketch him. And that's me and my dad. Um, 
I'm going to put all the money to this. Is uh, All the profit for this little comic is going to go to Dementia UK because I think it's quite a useful thing that doesn't get talked about a lot, that um, the kind of grief you have to deal with when, when with dementia or with somebody who hasn't passed away, who you, but you're losing. And it's, it's um, I'll probably give this to all my mum's nurses and uh, to anybody I know who, who finds it useful to, to understand a little bit more about ambiguous loss. But yeah, that's me. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's really lovely to be here and talking about my work. I'm going to talk mainly about my book, Coma. I'm going to talk solely about my book, Coma. Um, I'm going to give a little background um, beforehand. So um, in 2013, um, I lost my right leg and um, glute muscle to a deadly bacterial infection called necrotizing myositis. Um, it's commonly known the, as the flesh eating bug. So, um, and I was put into a coma for 15 days. And um, whilst I was in that coma, I experienced really vivid hallucinations and altered reality. And I guess it's kind of like generally called ICU delirium. And what I've kind of like learned is like everybody's ICU delirium is quite different. So um, I really wanted to, um, I really wanted to share this sort of like experience. It was kind of like quite a nightmare experience, but um, I was really rather fascinated by it as well. So um, it took a couple of years to get to the point when I was actually emotionally ready to start working on it. Um, so I know and prior to that, I was drawing everything and anything that wasn't to do with um, illness. It was about sweets and other things that I really loved, things that made me very happy. However, I definitely um, wanted to write about um, this experience. So this first image um, is not in the book. It was basically my introduction, me starting off. And um, I drew this back in 2016, complete with uh, spelling mistakes. And um, I sort of presented this at um, the Graphic Medicine Conference in Dundee. And it was really just to talk about is my intent this is what I'm going to do and I was talking about um things like how I was going to tell this story things like depiction of pain because pain played a big part and um and I was thinking about how I would demonstrate that um visually so seagulls um play continue to play a part in the story but the reason they play a part is because on the morning that um I started to get seriously ill and my pain was kind of like uh just going through the roof um seagulls were sort of like outside my window circling and calling and um it was kind of like quite a sight and quite a sound so um it was something that I kind of like used again later on so this was my kind of like first um my first sort of like drawings really and then I kind of like discovered that I wasn't quite ready I wasn't quite emotionally strong enough to do it and I kind of like tinkered around the outside of it for for um, a couple of years until it got to um, the, around the time of the Myriad graphic novel competition. And I thought, actually, I really do want to work on this and get my act together. So I used elements of it. And um, this is my sort of like, I guess my, my sketches. And I drew the first sort of like 15 pages. Um, I didn't plan anything. I just sort of like um, used bits from my sketchbooks and just kind of like plotted it out really. And um, and the medieval skeleton plays a big part later on, but that was my first kind of like hallucination. So I sort of like this is my my basically my um, my roughs that I stick on the light box, and then I drew it with with black pen, and um, and amazingly it was shortlisted, uh, sort of which was fantastic. But um, I wasn't entirely happy with it, and also it was longlisted for the um, Lady Sue comic as well I think was that in 2020 2019 2019 I think yes which was wonderful but I sort of um having got shortlisted and longlisted that was great but I just needed to go back to the drawing board it felt very unwieldy and I hadn't planned and it felt like a story that was so complex I really had to plan it and actually initially I was only going to focus on my hallucinations but um 
uh, my husband Dan had kept a diary. He started the diary a few days in after I'd got seriously in and, and was put into a, this medically induced coma. And so that actually really helped me make sense of it and help other people possibly understand what I was experiencing. So this was, um, I think, 2018, and then I was like back to my sketchbooks. So I sort of mentioned briefly this um, medieval skeleton, and that was, I'd say, it's my first hallucination. So I've also described the experience as something of a purgatory. Um, it was very dark, and it was sort of like 15 long nights of the soul. So it felt very rooted in this medieval world. So I started to kind of like look for ways of, um, I guess, symbols and ways of sort of like just um, depicting this medieval world. So I, I sort of came away from panels and just started to play. And I just love sketchbooks just to play with shape and ideas and create these sort of like tableaus. So the one on the uh, right is my surgery tableau. Okay. And also I was sort of like drawing um, you know, us, my husband and I, and our children and other elements continuously in my sketchbook. You know, I still wasn't quite like beginning the graphic novel again. Um, and for consistency, I sort of like started making models. I like to occasionally come away from drawing. So I sort of like need to do things with my hands. So I made these models, which I then drew um, throughout the books, uh, they sort of like served several purposes. One, um, because this was such a personal story, this was about us and I was using our names, um, having these models sort of like meant it was a sort of like slightly removed from me and us and I was drawing and these were the characters I, would, I was drawing and they had our names. And there were also, um, there's our children in there in, in a little box. I have boxes of heads everywhere. And, um, and some of the other characters um, that are in the comic. They're also kind of like really handy for shining lights. So if I wanted sort of like to add drama, I'd sort of like add little, little bits of, of um, you know, add light to them. So they served quite a few purposes. So this is sort of like um, back to being organized. So my initial sort of like working with Myriad, uh, sorry, uh, for the competition. I just sort of like didn't think beyond the first 15 pages, but to actually start turning into a fully fledged graphic novel, I had to be a lot more organized, which is slightly runs against the grain. So I had his beautiful diary. Um, I stuck very much to the words he used, um, only changing them occasionally when I wanted to translate them into dialogue and when I did that, I actually spoke to the people he mentioned in the diary. And initially they said, you know, I'm not going, I won't be able to remember a thing. But when I showed them little sketches I'd done and like the, the extracts from the diary, it sort of like all came back. So this is, of course, you know, this was 2013 it happened and I was talking to people in, you know, 2019. So I was able to then um, take his little comments about what people have said and actually turn them into conversations actually using their voices. Um, so this is like his diary on the left and on the right hand side is my patient diary that the um, ICU staff um, kept and this was the first entry and patient diaries were really quite new at that time. I think they'd only been um, introduced a year or two before um, and, um, and Lucy, uh, who's now a matron at the Royal Sussex, uh, was one of the people that introduced them at the Royal Sussex. So this is sort of like going through, leafing through um, Dan's diary, and then I was doing this really, really um, very scruffy little um, thumbnails in this sort of like um, huge post-it pad I had. And it sort of like seemed to just perfect to just kind of like sitting in a really comfy chair and working through and just like I wasn't at this point sort of adding the dialogue I was just sort of you know drawing the scenes and then I took some of them and I, I like working in miniature and I did more detailed um, pages and I guess these are probably about A6 smaller than A6 and then it got to a point when I was drawing Dan's diary so I had these alternating these would be alternating throughout the comic 
Um, and I was re I realized that some of it was just doing too much detail to be to be doing it so so small. So um, I abandoned that and started working to scale. However, my um, uh, my story I actually wrote completely um, in in sort of thumbnail thumbnail form. There were no words to that. So the entire experience or, or story was actually drafted in in drawing form. And then I sort of like had, had several of these sort of A3 sheets and um, I sort of color coded things. So I'd have um, Dan was drawn in blue pencil and my story is drawn in red pencil. So I could correlate, you know, what what he was sort of um, describing and just kind of make it sort of fit with my um what I was experiencing sometimes it was really clear it's like the veil between our world, worlds was really thin and sometimes it wasn't but I could sort of like gauge where I was in my journey um with where he was sort of like what he was documenting in his diary um so I talked about the medieval and I was sort of like this was like an, a pay, an early page that I sort of like drafted. I just wanted to see what it was going to look like. And I was working in charcoal. And then I was drawing these, um, these borders. And my goodness, I love just drawing these borders. So the symbolism here, which I'll talk about again in a minute. Um, so my intention was for every chapter or the chapters were days. Um, I, I'd sort of like do a new border. And this is sort of like I've got pain and fear and infection and death all, all kind of like tied up right here. And I'll, I'll sort of like, um, I've, I've got the illustrations, I can share them a bit more clearly. But um, as I was working on it, I just figured I was like over the pudding. As, as much as I enjoyed um, drawing these borders, I realized I was never going to finish this comic. I'd needed another six months. And it would have been a lovely six months, but I just didn't have it. So away they came. But I kept a little bit of the medieval and um, I mean, it was th that was kind of like rooted in the experience. So um, I, I drew a map and these are the the um, on the end papers of the book. So my sort of like surgery tableau stayed and a little bit of a border that I'd sort of like doodled in my sketchbook made it in. And then my um, my purgatory map, which I'd actually drawn originally in, in 2016 and then I'd sort of like just, um, I can't, guess I can like plumped it up. I can like made it slightly more 3D. So this is inspired by um, Dante's um, map of purgatory. Um, I think it's actually in reverse. So um, it's like, if you read the comic, um, it doesn't explain throughout the comic what things are, but if you read it and then you come come to the end and then you see these explanations, these little labels, you can go back. I don't know about anybody else, but I, I read graphic novels over and over again and just keep going back. I do a run through in a couple of hours and then I'm straight back in, just like pouring over it. So, and I like maps. So I wanted to really have a map in there. Um, so the, the pages, the, the two worlds um, are, are drawn quite differently. So um, Dan's diary is drawn in a simple line, um, which slightly mirrors what I did originally for the, um, the, the Myriad competition. But then I used brush pen and it just didn't feel quite right for his, um, for his story, for his words. So I used... Um, charcoal pencil, quite a lot of charcoal pencils, and my desk is still covered and stained with charcoal, my face would be covered in charcoal. Um, line I used because I was going to be doing quite complex things, I was going to be doing interiors, I was going to do like hospital bedsides and machinery and buildings and roads and cars, and I just thought, you know, I'm not going to give myself too much work to do, I'm going to keep it in simple line. And also, I love um, the fractured line of charcoal, how it's such a, a primal um, drawing material and it seemed to capture the vulnerability of his state of mind as well. And as it sort of like cracks and breaks on the page. And it also makes me slightly feel a little bit um, vulnerable because there's only so much control I have over it as it's sort of like gliding or sometimes stumbling across the page. And then um, for my um, altered reality and hallucinations, I sort of 
I did draw them in um, brush pen and walnut ink, and then I scanned them in and coloured them in uh, Photoshop, just overlaying colour. And I wanted to keep those sort of like the rich colours, the apricots and um, blues and the emeralds there, and back to a nod to the to the medieval. So even though it's sort of like it's where I started, I was sort of like stripping it back and just kind of like keeping things that I they were my route into the story, whether they sort of like were obvious to the reader, it sort of didn't matter. It's kind of like how I'd actually um, got back into telling the story. So there were, that's the sort of kind of like process. There was, it was it's kind of like quite a um, complex story to tell. There was sort of like lots of different elements other than just, you know, Dan's diary and, um, and my telling, there was sort of like, um, you know, quite, I wanted to sort of convey um, a little bit of the horror of the experience. I wanted people to really understand it. And so I started with the things I knew, which um, one of the primary emotions I felt was fear. And I sort of like manifested that in, in, sort of in characters. So um, the fear for myself, I drew as, um, as a prey animal, as a rabbit, sometimes it's like a hare, and I've decided I don't come kind of like it. They sort of like swap between the two, um, and uh, that's so. That's when I had fear slowly for myself, um, and it's just pure fear which had shaped my reality. And then I also drew myself as a vixen, and that was fear for my children. So halfway through, and my my experience changes um, as my children come in to see me and fear for myself is replaced by fear for them and um, the reason I have depicted myself as a vixen is way back many years ago when my eldest was born she's 21 now um, I remember kind of leaving the house with her strapped to me and um, finding it strange that I was walking out in the street with this most precious creature and I felt very primal and I, I thought myself a vixen. And so, um, and so she came back to the fore at that time. Um, I use symbolism uh, to tell, so I sort of break it up a little bit with, um, you know, I say Dan's story and my story. And then there's this kind of like, um, another kind of like story that's happening slightly outside of my head. So here I have the crow, which is quite a gothic archetype, and that represents um, uh, death. And the seagull is back, or the seagulls are back, and they are pain. Um, the serpent is inspired by the Ouroboros, which is about life, death, and rebirth. And I sort of like in the book, I talk about the Ouroboros, but really it is just the serpent because it's about life and death. There's no rebirth with this infection. And then the, the blue creature in the center is the coma, my coma itself, and it's headless but for hospital doors. And I'm carried in the belly of it. Um, and it's, I wanted to draw it as something um, that you felt a slightly emotional pull towards, it both being um, vulnerable and elegant um, and strong all at the same time. Um, the experience of my hallucinations um, was sort of like a best described as sort of like a, um, as breakdown of, of different um, different memories. So these came from three sort of like distinct places. So there were kind of like echoes through time. So this first image um, is probably uh, relating to to my childhood and to like childhood fam family relations like with my, my parents and um, yeah, my early family. And, um, and then in the center is um, memories. I think the hallucinations are inspired by recent memories. So three months, a few months prior to um, getting ill, I'd been in Liverpool's Chinatown and we, I'd been with a friend and we were going to write a story about um, Liverpool Chinatown. So it's kind of like, it's quite imprinted on my mind and actually then it sort of like manifests itself at some point in my hallucinations. 
And then the end was the sort of like, um, the end image is about the present and how um, around my bedside, how events around my bedside actually affected um, my reality. Um, also, as I was working on, I, I put blinkers on when I was actually working on the comic and I was just drawing things as I remembered them because they stayed very, very vivid. Think about um, I See Delirium. It's, it's very much a lived experience. You know, it's like it's not easily forgotten like a dream. It's you very much carry it in inside you and it's very, very vivid. So um, early on, um, I think I'm not sure I wasn't sedated at this point. So I can only imagine it was, I had severe sepsis and then went on. Am I in the last five minutes? No, I'm okay. Um, I saw like two medics approach the end of my bed and the faces were half skulls. And this is the point where my fear kind of like really took flight. Um, and it was only later when, after I'd put my sort of like my drawings down on paper that I started to see how they related to underworld myths but also I thought how they related to really simple language as well. So, you know, my body knew it was in peril, even if I didn't, at, at no point did I think I was um, in peril or I was going to die. So even seeing sort of like skulls and skeletons, it's sort of like, it just didn't click. Um, but interestingly, um, so, so uh, sorry, I, I think, you know, in my mind, my body knew I was sort of like half dead, as it were. So here I am seeing an image of, uh, and a depiction of something that is half dead. Um, also another point, I'm sort of like balancing on the edge of a feather. And that interestingly relates to Egyptian underworld myth, where um, the weight of your heart is, is um, balanced against that of the, of the weight of a feather. And if you're, heart is heavier than the feather then you're not going to make it through you're sort of like you're destined for hell um also um the goddess hell in norse underworld myth um her face is half uh, alive and half skull and she greets the elderly and the infirm as they enter the underworld so i don't know if you want me to read this i actually can't see half of that because the weird little screens covering it um you if you want to or like i can pass over that's okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> um also at some point i i did end up in ancient china which obviously in my mind is because i'd been sort of like i'd spent time in um chinatown in um, liverpool but also interesting as i was sort of like waking as i was ascending from my um my uh coma as I, as they were waking me up I was spinning and it's a really strong sensation of spinning and actually throughout the sort of like um the experience I've been accused of a murder and I was sort of like throughout it I was pleading my innocence however right at the end I think it was believed that um I, I don't want to share any spoilers actually no some people are reading it so I won't say too much but um but I'm sort of like spinning as I'm coming to the surface and um looking into you know underworld, global underworld myths. It was kind of like, it was interesting how that related to Chinese underworld myth and the wheel of life and how you um, you spin either back into your old life or you spin into a new life. And of course I span into my old life in waking up. And this is slightly inspired by um, uh, an image I saw, a, a tapestry I saw at uh, the British Museum of um, the Chinese sort of, um, 10, uh, 10 levels of hell. So, um, and this was the sort of like part of the, the spiraling, um, spinning up and out. This is the, the part of the circle of life. So there's sort of like things that I, I knew going into writing this story. And the whole point was that I was hoping that um, working on it would reveal answers that I, you know, I didn't know I had questions for. And I have to say, I didn't do this as a cathartic experience because um, uh, I, I had to get to a point when I was strong enough creatively, creatively rather than emotionally to write this, you know, my, I sort of um, recovered watching things like Game of Thrones. I sort of had to zone out of life to recover. And this was me coming back into it. So, um, 
but actually when I drew things on the page, I discovered things that I didn't realize that seem obvious. So, you know, at one point I had circus ninjas like somersaulting into rescuing. And I knew they're circus ninjas because this is your, this is my reality. This is my, you know, in my head. Actually, when I drew them on the page, I realized that they were actually surgeons. And that also it tied in with um, uh, um, Dan's diary saying that later on I had had to be ventilated again. So this tied in with a point later on when I was ventilated again. Um, there was also, you know, I, I thought, well, it was obvious that I was um, absorbing um, what people were saying around me. But it was only after I actually had drawn the book and I had the book in my hand that I was realized that I was also absorbing the emotions around me. So, um, you know, I'd been accused of this murder, but like I know now that I'm actually looking at myself because there was a point when I was bleeding out before they actually amputated my leg when they tried to save my leg. And then they realized that um, that just wasn't going to work. So I probably, this was. Um, a, an out of body experience that I had looking down at my my body. However, I I um, knew that people were anxious and panicking over this body, and I didn't realize it was me. I just knew that they were reacting to it. So people were reacting to me, and I was the cause of their reactions. But I just didn't understand why. So I absorbed their um, absorbed all of this, and I just turned it into a sort of like. Um, a guilt, you know, not understanding why I was the cause of this. Um, so the biggest, you know, um, contributor to this um, book, Tacoma, is my husband, Dan, who, as I say, showed an extract from his um, diary early on, um, just being there, bearing witness, helping me um, uh, understand what happened to, to me, to us, and, um, you know, at the time he was writing it and he just treated it as a brain dump at the end of the day because he just didn't know what was going to happen from one day to the next. We were sort of like for the first week, you know, we de de you know, things were quite, quite desperate and lurching on the edge very much. Um, so it just was a place that he could just kind of like just pour, pour things out. And it had been a friend that had suggested that he keep a diary. So, um, and I read it about a year after he wrote it and it, you know, my memory was kind of like pretty broken um, as well as I was um, even a year afterwards. So I'd read it and then I'd forget and then I read it again. And it was like hugely emotional, you know, um, knowing that what they'd been through, what he'd been through, what the family had been through, um, but it also, you know, helped having somebody bear witness to it. Incidentally, I was woken up on my son's birthday. It was his eighth birthday. So um, <laughs> like and, um, Dan, the, he knew at some point that they were, they felt that they could like bring me up and out of the, um, out of the coma. But um, he, he thought he might have been able to get through Teddy's birthday first. So um, they were just about to cut the cake when he got the phone call. So it was like, blimey, okay. <laughs> That's a kind of like feed all the children. And um and then kind of like zoom to the hospital as as uh, as soon as he could. <laughs>